Easter to you, Easter Sunday, and we just praise the Lord for His resurrection, uh, victorious over sin and death, uh, over all things. We are so grateful that we can be here this morning. Uh, you know, we, we weren't sure which way things would go with the lockdown, and we, whenever um, our president uh, calls a family meeting, uh, he always looked nervous because he, he, he always throws these wild cards into the mix. You never know what he's going to do. And, uh, and, uh, and we were so thankful when, when he didn't announce our closure that actually added to our numbers and allowed us to even have more people. So I'm so glad that we could uh, yeah, meet. This morning we had a sunrise service down at the play and uh, we, we, we knew the sun was there. It was behind a cloud, but uh, although it was obscured, we knew the sun was there. And uh, it was just a blessed time just to be able to worship and praise God and that's together. If you're a visitor with us this morning, uh, welcome. Nice to always have visitors and, uh, and regulars alike. It's also nice to have uh, you with us and visitors. I see some unfamiliar faces. I uh, don't want to embarrass anybody and ask you where you're from, but hopefully afterwards I get to, you, to meet you and say hello. And uh, so welcome. I'm going to call on, on Nathan this morning. He's going to read for us and uh, open our service in prayer. Thanks, Good morning, everyone. So our uh, scripture for this morning is from Mark, chapter 16. Just starting in verse 1, 1 to 7. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they, so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll, roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So there is an account of what this special day, this holy day, commemorates and uh, for us, what, what represents for us. So let us bow our heads in prayer as we thank God for the joy and the hope that he has brought to this world uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. Holy God, we are so thankful, Lord, that we can come before you this morning. Lord, we know that we are here purely by your grace. We are here, Lord, purely by um, the work that you have done in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for paying the price that we cannot pay through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for not only paying the price, but for also securing for us a place in heaven, Lord. Lord, we are thankful that we can come before you with arms open, with hands open, coming before you with nothing that we have done in and of ourselves. We thank you that we can come before you uh, in the name of Jesus, that we can point you to him uh, as the person who paid for our sins. The reason why we can come before you, uh, even now in prayer, Lord, is through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we come before you this service and this morning, uh, I pray that you would yeah, just work in our hearts, Lord. If there's anything in our hearts that is uh, getting in the way of just worshiping you, Lord, and glorifying your name, just looking in awe at your beauty and at, your, at the mercy that you've done, glorifying you for the, the grace and the mercy that you have poured, down, poured out for us. Lord, I pray that you would convict us of those things. Lord, I pray that you help us to repent of those things and to cast them out. We pray, Lord God, that as we come before you this morning in worship, as we come before you to listen to your word preached to us, I pray, Holy God, that you would send your spirit to work in our hearts. I pray that um, your joy and worship would just overflow this morning. From each and every single one of us, Lord, as we just celebrate and rejoice uh, in the hope that you have given us, Lord, in the new life that you have given us through your Son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
be seated. I don't know if you uh, got lots of chocolate this morning. Uh, maybe you did or, or didn't. Uh, one thing we've learned about uh, about the uh, Easter chocolate eggs and, and the garden is that living in these parts of the world, uh, squirrels enjoy Easter eggs. So uh, the hunt is always on in our garden if there ever were Easter eggs. Uh, they weren't there very long. My kids didn't get to them first. The uh, squirrels certainly uh, would, and then you'd have these overactive squirrels in your garden uh, running on, on pure chocolate. But I wonder about you, boys and girls, have you ever lost something? Something important to you? Uh, you know, immediately you think maybe your brother or your sister or somebody took it and hid it from you. Uh, that's always the first port of call, isn't it? Check with your sibling if they've taken it somewhere. Because uh, normally that is the case, isn't it? Everything that's wrong in the world is as a result of, of your sibling, uh, that, uh, that they've done something against you. Well, we lost a set of car keys. We we're talking on Friday about car keys and, and keys in general. And, and what an annoyance it is when you can't find the keys and you need to go somewhere. Uh, we lost a set of car keys for our car. And it's one of these ones where the remote control, the alarm is built into it. If you know those keys, they cost a little penny. The last time I checked, it was about three or four thousand rand for one of these keys. And we lost this key. And we went looking everywhere for this key. We even went to the shopping center. We were lost with the time we saw that set, that set of keys. We knew at the shopping center in Fisher. Uh, and uh, we went there and asked security, is there a lost and found box somewhere? Uh, that uh, Maybe there's a set of keys in this box. Anyway, the month passed. We figured it must have fallen out and we got out the car somewhere, got picked up and, and uh, become somebody's toy or something. And of course it, it was a, an annoyance to, to know that somewhere this keeps. Anyway, winter slowly creeping in and now with winter coming along, I went through my cupboard again, pulled out all my jackets to clean in, getting ready for winter. And there's a set of keys in my jacket pocket. It's been hidden away for a whole year and we've been looking for these keys. And I can tell you, there was such happiness in our household. All the blaming of who had the keys last and hidden in some way. And all, there was so much forgiveness flowing and love again in the household uh, as we found that set of keys. I think you all know when you've lost something and then you find it again, it's always such a joy. And, and I think as we think back on a Good Friday and what we lost in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and as he has been, as it were, as we remember these last uh, days, how uh, the Lord was, was hidden in the tomb. But we are so glad today as what was lost in a sense has been found. What was taken from us has again been received. As, as Nathan read for us, these ladies who went to the tomb, uh, fearful and, and afraid and sad, full of sorrow. You can imagine the, the disciples' the sadness of Jesus being taken from them. Suddenly now he has returned to them and he shows himself to them once again. This is why today is such a happy day for us. Friday is a, it's a day of remembrance. It's a somber day as we are reminded of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and as he was placed in that tomb and there he lay, removed, taken from us as, as it were, taken from, from the disciples. But today is a day that we celebrate that Christ has been returned to us, that Christ rose from the dead and that we have this eternal life. And this is why we are here today to celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ and that which was uh, accomplished on the cross and what was done for us. We always think, uh, we can always think that Christ has risen from the dead, but we, had to, uh, we actually need to also pause and remember that Christ had to die in order for it to rise uh, from, from the dead. I want to pray this morning and I want to focus our prayers and attention this morning on our young people in particular. As you know, with COVID around and uh, the, it's been so disruptive to so many things. And one of those things, of course, has been our, our children and our youth ministry uh, that has not been able to function. And, uh, and we really want to pray that God will, will make a way for us as a church and open a door for us that we uh, once again can have a thriving uh, youth ministry and children's uh, ministry. Let's pray. And let's, let's pray for our, our young people uh, this morning. Lord, we do thank you for the new life that we have today, Lord. We thank you that we do not remain in, in a state of, of, of remembering a Good Friday. 
Lord, as Friday has come and gone, as your death on the cross and your being placed in the tomb has been remembered, we come to you today, Lord, thanking you for the new life, that, that we can be, like you, Lord, raised from the dead, that we have been given new life, that we are now children of God. And we thank and praise you for this today, Lord. We thank you for the, uh, the new life that you've given to, you, to every child of God here today, Lord. Lord, we do pray for our young people and for our children, Lord. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the prospect of, of babies coming into this world. Some of our moms uh, expecting, Lord. We pray especially for Emily, who is on the brink of, of, of having their little one, Lord. And we just pray for her, Lord, that you be with Nathan and Emily. And as they prepare for that big day, we do pray, Lord God, especially that you be with mom, as she must deliver the child. For the whole household, Lord, as we know, it's a, it is a, an upheaval when a, when a new little one is brought into the home and, and routines and all kinds of things. It's quite unsettling for, for the household. So we just commit them to you, Lord. We pray for uh, Candace as well, Lord. We think that she's doing so much better. And we do pray, Lord, that you just continue to uh, keep her strong and well. Lord, Lord we just uh, pray too for Scola, for Scola, and for their expectancy as well, Lord. And as she prepares herself as well, Lord, we just commit them to you. We thank you, Lord, for the children in our church. Uh, it's always so nice to see the little people running around in our church, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for every little one of them, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus, as, uh, as a church, that, Lord, we would be faithful uh, in ministering to them, uh, faithful in reaching out to them, and uh, being a good, faithful witness, each one of us, Lord, Lord, also as a church, as a body, Lord, uh, that you would make a way for us, Lord, to be able to uh, have a thriving ministry once again, Lord. We know it's been such an unsettling year, and so many things have fallen by the wayside, Lord. And Lord, we just pray, even as we prepare to start Sunday school again, uh, having started and now having to restart again, Lord, uh, for the next week, Lord, we just pray for Gabby and the team, Lord, as they prepare themselves, Lord. Part of those young people as they will receive your word. We pray too for our teenagers, Lord. We pray for those who are on their final year. We pray for Jaden as he prepares to uh, write the trip to God this year. And we just commit them to you. We pray for God that you be with them and bless them and help them with the work uh, that you must do this year. Lord. We pray for uh, our teenagers church because we know Lord it is a very unsettling time in their lives and uh, there is so much change happening within them Lord and uh, it's an unsettling time for them too Lord and so Lord would you just pray that they would know your love and your care uh, that they would know their identity in you Lord God and uh, not seek to try and find it Lord in their friends or even in themselves but that they would be secure in their knowledge that you care for them that you love them and that they are your people so just uh, bless our church, Lord, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the Sunday school teachers, for our youth leaders, for all those involved over the years in, in these various activities. And we pray, Lord God, that you would even stir the hearts of others who are willing and wanting to get involved, that you, Lord Jesus, uh, would stir them uh, and give them, Lord, the confidence to step forward and to get involved with the young people. So Lord, we just praise you and thank you Lord, that we can uh, bring uh, these people to you. We also think for those who are unwell, Lord, we know that little Aviva Stavridis has been going through some intense treatment, has not been well, and they fly to Perth into a uh, semi coma and it's a day too, Lord. We just pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll be with this little girl, Lord, uh, for the family as well. We look on and watch what's happening to her. We just commit to that. Whole family, it's the Reedy's family to you, Lord. I just ask you, Jesus, for your, for your mercy, for your hand of healing to be on the Ravina, and uh, that the doctors and the nurses who are caring for her would know what to do for her. We just thank you that Hunter is doing so much better after his surgery and after the treatment that he's had. And Lord, as they prepare for more tests and to see the results of that surgery, we do pray, Lord, for good news that. That would be a very positive result. So we do praise and thank you for your faithfulness and for uh, your mercies which we receive every day. And so we can have these things to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All on our worship team again to come and be.
Yes. One more three more songs? One more, one more song. Let's stand and sing as we hear ourselves to hear God's word this morning in Isaiah 53. Let's stand and sing as we do that.
them. And uh, we are looking at that one uh, this morning. It is uh, from verse chapter 53, from verse 10 to 12, uh, those last uh, three verses. Let's, uh, let's pray to people who do that. Lord, please, we come before you now as your humble servants. I ask, Lord, please speak, for your servants are listening, Lord. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, give us understanding into deep truths and insights into, into this uh, Isaiah 53, Lord, a very well-known portion of Scripture that has been loved and cherished by so many in, over the centuries, Lord, as we have remembered uh, our Lord Jesus Christ through it, Lord. And so as we come before you today, Lord, humbly, Lord, we ask that you would give us understanding and insight to the truths of your word. Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read to you from verse 10. If you want to read the whole poem, you'll have to go to chapter 52, from verse 13 onwards, right up to where we are today. I'm just going to read the last three verses of this poem. It says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Isaiah 53, 11 says, After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Verse 12, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life until death, and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Today is often called Resurrection Sunday, and uh, for good reason. We know that uh, it's on this day that it's been set aside in the Christian calendar to remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The tomb is empty. You can go to Jerusalem today, you'll find a tomb, which they say possibly could be uh, the tomb of our Lord. And as you leave this tomb, you can actually walk into it. It's not a grave, like our graves in the ground. It's actually a tomb in a mountainside that's been uh, cut out. And as you walk out, there's a big sign, he's got here, he is risen. Much like if this uh, sign behind here, he is risen, he is not here. But he certainly is here by his Holy Spirit, isn't he? He might not be here in person, and there is no place where you can go. You can go to many parts in, in Israel, and you can go to places where you can actually, uh, where, where certain people are buried, right down to Abraham and Isaac and David, and you can actually go and visit their tombs, and inside those tombs there are bones of the people who have, who have passed away, but you will not find the body of our Lord Jesus Christ anywhere, because he is risen. Now, Isaiah prophesied 700 years before the event. If you do the maths, it's about 2,700 years ago. That's how old this passage of Scripture is that we are looking at today. Plus, minus a couple of years, of course, depending on what calendar or what theory you're using in terms of calculating the dates. 700 years before the actual events, Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would be alive after his suffering after his death, that he would be alive. Verses 9 and 12 tell us that uh, that he was very much dead, but now is alive. Uh, and and you, you, you find that the word, you don't find the word uh, resurrection as such in this passage of scripture, but certainly there is a very strong expectation of it here in this passage. Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, this is, is one that uh, this is the one who would be crushed, we are told. This is the one who would suffer. This is the one who would die, the Messiah. And then his life would be a sacrificial offering. Now, offerings were not made. They were, they were made when the animal was dead. And so there's very much an understanding as you read through this poem that the Messiah would die, that he would actually be dead. Uh, that his life would be poured out unto death. But that same person, we are told, would see his offspring and that his days would be prolonged and it says that he will see the light of life and so although you see this very much uh, 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 you see death very much prevalent in this poem you also see very much that he's alive 
Now, it, it, Jesus' offspring explicitly replies, implies that there is a resurrection that is envisaged here. Uh, and we can see his offspring today. You can just look around you. There you see the offspring of the Lord, uh, the children of God. You can imagine how Isaiah, how he must have sounded so confused to his contemporaries, those people of his day. Uh, you know, it is, you know that, that somehow the Messiah, is he, is he dead or is he alive? What are you saying, Messiah? Because you seem confused in this passage as to whether he's dead or alive. You, you're contradicting yourself, they probably even said. And yet, Isaiah still believed so strongly and firmly as he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write these words down, to have his scribe write these things down for him and record it for us today. Now we can look in hindsight and we can see how this came about, how this was possible, how this was realized. But to understand now, and you can understand, it's not surprising if you look in Jewish tradition, uh, how it says that uh, Isaiah was martyred by King Manasseh uh, by being sawn in two. Uh, he was not, as all the prophets were executed, he was martyred for uh, writing these kinds of things down. And you can understand why when you read these uh, passages, how challenging it must have been to receive this, and, and how he must have seen that like, somehow he's, he's lost his mind, that he's writing these things uh, that seem to, to almost contradict themselves. But this fourth servant song, this, this, this poem, has focused up until now very much on the physical and the emotional suffering of the Messiah, that there would be very real uh, suffering. You, you find it in, in this poem uh, that he was disfigured uh, beyond human recognition, that he would be despised, that the Messiah would be rejected, that he would be a man of suffering, and that he was punished for us. You read words like stricken, afflicted, pierced, uh, crushed, wounded, oppressed, uh, uh, and, and, and these words are all found in this, in this last, uh, this last uh, uh, poem. Of course, you can go to the Gospels and you can see how he was crushed, how he was afflicted, how he was pierced. You can see the fulfillment of all these different words that we find in Isaiah uh, 53 describing our Lord, and you see them graphically fulfilled. We've had one reading this morning uh, just explaining how Jesus would come to life, but we also read on Friday how he suffered in that, in, to the point of death. Up until now, we've seen his physical and emotional suffering. But then in our reading today, there's a little word there that we probably skip over sometimes, yet. It's like the but in a, in a, in a passage. It's the yet you can see, and it, 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 it tells us, the translators are telling us, there is now a transition coming. coming. There's a shift in this passage. He's trans transitioning uh, from the humiliation of Christ to the exaltation of the same uh, Messiah. And now in verse 10 and 11 reveals that his suffering was of a spiritual nature as well. Yes, it, were, it was blood. Yes, it were, was piercing. Yes, there was very real physical suffering. There was emotional suffering as he was despised and rejected. You can imagine the turmoil of all of that. And we can, we, we often, um, we can even let our imaginations run wild. And I'm sure that if you've watched The Passion of Christ and you see the, uh, the, 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 the movie, uh, how, how, how gory it actually is. And there's a lot of emphasis, even I think an overemphasis sometimes on that side of things, on the physical suffering of our Messiah. But here we see that his suffering was of a spiritual nature as well. That it reveals the suffering was, was spiritual, not only were, those sufferings, were the sufferings inflicted on him by, by men on his body, the physical uh, martyring and, and the physical suffering that he had, but there were wounds inflicted on him by God himself, on, on his soul. And certainly that must be the greatest wound of all. It's hard for us perhaps to, to accept that, to see that. But the point is that it's, it's not simply the evil actions of people who determine God's servants. Uh, to, it's not people's evil actions that determine our fates and, the, and our destinies in life or even in death. This was true for Jesus Christ and it is certainly true for us as well. Our lives indeed are in God's hands and we must see that in this passage. This is a fundamental fact that we find here that, that's showing us in these verses. And if we miss this fact, 
I'd suggest that even we miss the whole poem altogether and the significance of it, of the whole passage together. Verse 10 itself begins and it ends with the sovereign purposes of God, with this, uh, which, which really form the foundation of this poem, the Lord's will. It was the Lord's will. It was not out of sight of God's will that this happened, that the cross happened, and that the Messiah would die. It is not out somehow how things got a little out of control on Good Friday, but God pulled things back. We see that it was very much in God's control. And you see that, this, that in the servant's sufferings as an offering for our sin, it was the Lord's will to, for him to be offered in our place. We know God promises to prosper and not to harm us. And it's all too easy to somehow think that that means somehow life is just going to always be peachy. It's just always going to be fine and, and okay. And then when bad things happen to us, it results in a faith crisis for so many. Because how? Because of bad theology. Because we think somehow God only gives out good things to us, right? Because that's what the Bible says. But Job says to us, can we only receive the good and not the bad? Job saw his sufferings as from the hand of the Lord. Yes, certainly God says he will prosper and not harm you. So even in our sufferings, even in our adversities, even in our sickness, in our sorrows, we must remember that God's purpose, his ultimate will, is to prosper. Even through those things. To help us, to benefit, to grow us through whatever we might do. When God allows suffering in our lives, it is not to destroy us. It's not to crush us. It's not to hurt us. It's simply to grow us. Like a small child who only ever gets what they want, who never hears the word no, who never hears the words don't do that, never hears the words sit still or, or that no, you cannot have that. Have you ever noticed something in the shopping aisles? And they put all the sweets by the tool. <laughs> you know, you've got this queue of people behind you who are all annoyed because they've been standing too long in the queue and now your kid comes and tries to slip in that chocolate. And now you've got to have a discussion with them about the health benefits of eating that chocolate or not. Uh, and, and you know you don't have time for that right now because the people behind you don't have the patience for that conversation right now. And so you capitulate and the, the store owners, they know it's, it's intentional. That's why they put it there. You give it to the child again, it's your better judgment. Maybe you're like, maybe you don't do that. If you just gave a child everything they want, every time your kid asked you for something, you just said yes, whether you knew it was good or bad for them, you would end up with a brat. You would end up with a dysfunctional adult, a discontent person, an entitled person, an ungrateful person, a very unhappy and a very mature individual in life. We know as parents a responsibility on us is often to say no. The responsibility on us is often to discipline, to correct, to show them the right way. And sometimes that involves some, some things that, as you say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And it does as parents, but it is something we have to do. And the fact is, God, our Father, disciplines those He loves. God allows suffering at times in order to prosper us, to grow us, to mature us through the process. Sometimes he will spare us of great suffering. Sometimes, mercifully, he will just simply intervene and, and heal or bring us to a very difficult uh, situation, even prematurely. But we know that ultimately, even if sometimes he says no to our prayers and we are asking him to deliver us, ultimately, he is saying yes to your good. Ultimately, he is a good God. The fact that Jesus suffered, that it was the will of God to crush him. It is, a, it is painful even to think of that. Uh, you know, you might disagree with somebody at the robots. Uh, you might have a disagreement with somebody in traffic about something or in a shop. But you really care about their opinion, do you? You don't go home and, and uh, with somebody and you have a road rage incident or somebody hoots at you. You don't go home and, and question your, your, your person and and, and feel down about it. It's when somebody you care about, when they somehow hurt you, when, when it's your spouse, when it's your friend, when it's a brother or sister, that's when it hurts the most. When it's somebody you deeply care about. And so as we think of our Lord on the cross and we think of his suffering 
as we think of his spiritual suffering, it was a suffering that he endured from God the Father, his Father, that certainly would have been the deepest wounds of all. And so we must thank God for all the painful experiences as we share in the sufferings of Christ. Because as we think about how they benefited Christ, how Christ was exalted through the process of suffering, we know that even in your sufferings, in my sufferings, that ultimately God is good. Ultimately God will do something good through your life, through your life. The most painful thing that Jesus had to endure on the cross was that which came from his Father as he was forsaken for our sin. I think the most painful words of the Bible that you find is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But why have my people forsaken me? Why has Peter forsaken me? He doesn't question those things. He questions, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are heart-wrenching words. Even in our suffering, sometimes we feel, feel that maybe God has forgotten. God, you don't see. Or, or God, somehow you've forsaken me. These are heart-wrenching words as the Son suffered for our sin. But it's in that moment that Jesus Christ, as He felt estranged from His Father, as He felt separated from His Father by sin, that, that perfect relationship between the Father and Son that existed, perfect union was suddenly, as it was separated, as it was forsaken, as Christ became sin, and, and you feel the depth of that separation that every sinner will know without Christ in heaven one day, that sense of being separated from God. We are reminded in Isaiah 53 verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. But we have to understand this and accept this fact. Although many might struggle to accept this in the character of God, that God would allow such a thing, that, that, the, that the death of his son was within his perfect will, but we must see it in the backdrop, in the context of the extent of God's love, the extent to which God would go to demonstrate His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord God took no pleasure in, in the Son's suffering. Father God took no pleasure in what was taking place. It was His will, it was not His good pleasure in looking on His Son's suffering. It was God's will to accept Christ's suffering as a penalty for us. Evil people and their actions were not in control of the situation on that day. And the resurrection reminds us that God is always victorious. That God is always in control. I prayed about Hunter this morning. I prayed about it either. You think how heart-wrenching it is for those parents as they have to let their children go into surgery? How difficult it is to know that? How difficult it is to allow your child to go through chemotherapy or radiation treatment or, or some sort of major surgery. Some of you as parents have had to do that. You've had to, you've had to give your child over to other people, to strangers, someone, to somehow treat your child. How difficult that is. Does it for a moment make you doubt as a parent, they, they, as parents, their love for their child? If anything, it confirms their love for the child. That they're willing to go through that in order for the child to be treated and to, 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 to hopefully be healed and, and cured of whatever illness they might have. It is because of the perfect nature of the son that he was worthy to suffer and it yielded perfect results as he went to the cross. Yahweh, God, yeah, the Lord, he's the one who actually makes the offering who is Jesus Christ, his son. Absolute perfection in the offering. It is the Lord God who, who makes his life that offering, we are told in our passage. Jesus as an offering for our sin. God's one and only son was given for our sin. And Jesus as his, his offering satisfied the needs of, of sinful people before our holy God and the righteous requirements of God Jesus and his willingness, he goes to the cross and he offers his life. He surrenders himself, knowing this is God's will, that your will be done. <coughs> as he prayed right at the very beginning, as he taught his disciples to pray, yeah, he shows what it means to say, 
your will be done as he went to the cross. And ultimately, it resulted in the resurrection and the church of believers. And this is what is means by it says, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. It tells us that God would raise the Messiah as we can look back and say God indeed did honor his word and raised his son from the dead. And the result is we are adopted into his family as children of God. 1 Peter 1 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are God's children. We are his offspring because Jesus willingly submitted himself to the will of the Father. He was crushed on our behalf in order to deal with our sin so that we can stand in fellowship with the Holy God and as God's holy people. We are his saints. Verse 11 says, By his knowledge my righteous servant will justify me. It says many, not all people, this is not universal salvation, that all will be saved. We are justified by knowing Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. That is by faith in Jesus Christ, justified by faith that those, in other words, who refuse to accept this offer of salvation are not justified. Those who refuse Jesus Christ's perfect offer of salvation have no other hope, no other options. There's nowhere else to go and they remain in their sin. And condemned in it as a result. Those who have chosen to reject God's offer of salvation. But to those who by the grace of God believe in Him, perfect pardon is applied in Jesus' atoning work. He has made us at one with God. Easy way to remember that the word atonement, that He has brought us at one with God, made us one with God. And this is a great comfort to each and every sinner, as we wrestle with our sins, as we wrestle with the things that, that go on in our lives, our thoughts, and even at times the things that we do, that we realize it was not the right thing to do, the things we've said, the things we've done, that we regret. It's a great encouragement to us that to not lose heart, not to not give up in our efforts, because we have been justified through Jesus Christ. God's grace is more than sufficient for you, whatever you might have done. As sin abounds, so we told in Romans 5.20, grace abounds more. Because of Jesus' work, we are justified. And forgiveness is enough for God. God's perfect forgiveness. We are made perfect in His sight. And therefore, we can be sure God's grace is sufficient for us all. Because of all that Jesus Christ endured in bringing about our salvation, this, this salvation a, a song, this salvation poem, this poem of the suffering servant, closes with Christ's exaltation, with Christ in his reward, and it is a fitting place to end on such a high. Jesus gave up the glory and the pleasure of all that being God in heaven would entail. He gave that to come into this world, to suffer, to be despised and rejected at the hands of evil men simply because it was the will of God, to make the ultimate self-sacrifice behind the veil of flesh, of flesh, accepting the hardships of this life, the mistreatment, and even such a shameful death. Verse 12 explains that Jesus' reward for doing such a thing comes with him. It can be read by saying that the servant has received his own people, the many who for, for, for whom he died, he's come to receive his own people. Jesus did not die in vain. He died for you. He died for me. But ultimately, he died for his Father in heaven. And as a result, we are saved. And we are received as his bounty and his reward. People who are saved, the church of Jesus Christ, this great multitude of nations have been redeemed through Jesus Christ, through his death, but also through his resurrection. Revelation 7 verse 9 talks about this great multitude from every nation. We also see that Jesus will also divide the spoils with the strong. And, and this is the idea, a military idea, an analogy of the spoils of war, where the winner takes the plunder that he has fully, that he has fully won, not finally won, 
but fully won. You see, the enemy is defeated, although he still fights on. We wage war against a defeated enemy. Until Christ returns and will deal with them finally, until then the war remains on the go. And so we are reminded by, by Paul in 1 Timothy 6 that Paul reminds us and encourages us to, to, to keep up the good fight of the faith as soldiers of Christ. Again, this military analogy. We know that the gates of hell will not stand in advance of the kingdom of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet the salvation of souls continues. And Christ, though, will return, as some of our songs reminded us here this morning, with his reward, with his people, and gather all those who are his to himself. All because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross as he paid for our sins. Because he did this, he receives a portion among the greats. His reward is with his people. His people are his reward, the church of Jesus Christ. You see, my friend, you are never on the losing side. You are never undone and never outdone because you are in Jesus Christ. Even though it is not always easy, it's not always an easy road to choose being a faithful child of God, because there is a very real struggle. There is a very real battle that we face as children of God. And our enemy remains, although he is defeated, remains very real and seeks to undo us, seeks to discourage us, seeks to uh, dis distract us from the good that we should be doing. You know, during the Second World War, uh, after the Normandy landings, they said that historians tell us that that was the decisive moment in the battle, in the war, the Second World War, when, when the soldiers landed, 1, 160,000 soldiers landed on those beaches, uh, many gave their lives as they landed on those beaches, and in the, in the weeks and months that would follow, but historians say that the German forces were broken there. That's where it all began. That was there, it was decisively determined the outcome of the war once the Normandy landings were successful. But did the war end there, right there and then? Well, certainly not. The enemy fought on. The Allied forces took in almost another three months before Germany surrendered. Germany refused to accept the defeat and had to be completely routed even though the war continued and the spoils were already being claimed along the way to Berlin, they continued to fight. And so we are here in this time in which we live, where we look forward to, we with great expectation look forward to the day of our Lord's return when the war will finally be over. But until then, there are many battles still to be fought, fought. But the decisive victory has been won in Jesus Christ. And so we know, as children of God, we must press on. We must push on. We must even fight on. The salvation of our souls is Jesus Christ's reward. And the, we are his plunder and his spoils, all because what Jesus Christ did on the cross and the victory he won by his resurrection from the dead. The sacrifices made by those on the beaches of Normandy and subsequent to that were, were ultimate sacrifices. Many gave their lives. Many lost their lives. You may say that we owe our freedom in many ways to them. It would be speaking German today if it wasn't for them and the sacrifices that they made. They fought for freedom. They fought for their families. They fought for many things. But they knew they weren't really fighting for themselves. It was a sacrifice that they were making. And that was their motivation. That was their reward. Jesus Christ willingly gave his life for you and for your freedom, for your life. He is the hero of the day, the saviour of the world. And we are privileged to be redeemed and his people on his side. Jesus can make intercession for us because he's earned the right to do so. Now, friends, brothers and sisters, sometimes it might feel like you're not on the winning side. Sometimes as you suffer, you might feel like you are really struggling to hold it together. Remember the one who did hold it together. Remember when you feel like you're coming undone, that there is one who was not outdone, and is the one who did not come undone, who overcame. He was, he was crushed, but not defeated. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ authenticates the will of God 
The will of God is not a hope so, or I wish it would be that way, but it is a certainty. God does what he says he will because he can. And remember this, in your sufferings, remember God is good in all he does. God's purposes will prosper. They will succeed no matter what. What might come against God's servants? God's ways are perfect. God is good. And He is the one who makes a way for His people. This is such good news for us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of our salvation. Of our eternity. That has been secured through Jesus Christ. This is the best news we have no matter what. It's not... Uh, why it, it, it's, it's not what might happen, what we read in the news, uh, it's, it, it makes us feel secure. It's what we read in the Word of God, what He has done, what God has done, no matter what you might be going through. And this is the best cure for our fears, this is the cure for our anxieties, for all our uncertainty we find in the promises in the Word of God. This is our hope in the Gospel and our salvation. We don't rest in such fickle, uncertain things like myself or like other people or the local world events, politics or economics or pandemics. Our hope is in the Lord. And whatever might happen, whether good or bad, and I say good or bad, because whether good things come our way that may seek to draw our affections and distract us away from Christ, good things can be as bad as bad things, Whatever might come our way, whether good or bad things that come our way that seek to discourage us and try and somehow undermine our confidence in Christ, this is why we can so confidently rest on the Bible and its promises. God's good and perfect plans will be carried out. Some of those plans will not be easy. Some of the things God has in store for us will not be comfortable for us. They may even be unpleasant, like it was for Job, who said, shall we only accept good from God and not trouble? God's plans may include the death of a loved one. God's plans may be severe illness. God's plans might be financial ruin at times. But we must always remember, God is sovereign. God, yes, could prevent all those things from happening to us. But some things He chooses to allow. To not to spare us of such, such things, but rather to take us through those things. To not only to grow us and to prune us, but also to show himself to us through those difficulties. Because you will see things in your suffering about God and learn things in your suffering about God that you will learn nowhere else. You will see them nowhere else. You will not grow in certain ways if you are only ever enjoying a good, easy life. We know we need suffering, right? We need exercise. No, no exercise at the time seems pleasant, doesn't it say that? No, it says no suffering at the time seems pleasant. You can put exercise in there or suffering is exercise. It doesn't seem pleasant at the time, but you know the reward is coming and there is a great reward afterwards. You learn more in the valleys of suffering than in the mountains of prosperity. As we read in Psalm 23, it says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. There is no way we can go where God will not be with us. Your rod and your staff that comfort me. You can say there, it doesn't say that you will never go through a dark valley, or experience evil, or experience hardship and sufferings and difficulties. Instead, the promises are that God will always be there. Whether on the mountaintop, which we always like to be on the top of the world, or whether in the deepest, difficult valley that you find yourself in, God is there to comfort and to guide us through and to uphold us. Because Jesus Christ went through the darkest valley and endured the vilest evil at the hands of evil people, we know that we are secure through those difficulties that we go through. <clears throat> what could we possibly go through that could in some way compare to what Christ has already been through? Because he lives you can face whatever might come your way. And we, can, we will overcome whatever might come your way because Christ overcame. As we trust in Him, as our faith is in Him, we are secure in Christ Jesus. I hope today as we've come to remember and to celebrate and, 
And there is a sense of real optimism in the air, isn't there? As we remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We also recognize that there are people here today who are really struggling. Struggling with doubts and fears, struggling with all kinds of issues that you might be facing in your home, with your health, with your finances, in so many ways. The promise is not that we will not go through those things, but that God will see us through those things and be with us through those things. And the resurrection reminds us that not everything that, that happens to us that, is, that we deem to be not good are necessarily bad for us. They're not all bad for us because all things are worked out for the good of those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's buy it. Let's thank the Lord for the promises that we find in His Word and for the hope that we have through the resurrection of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for these three verses that we've just looked at here this morning, Lord, that have reminded us once again of, of what you endured, what you went through for us, the suffering, the pain, the, the anguish of the cross, and your death, Lord. But Lord, we thank you that the poem does not end there, that there is a very real hope, Lord, the hope of the resurrection from the dead. In this life, Lord, you tell us you, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your suffering for us. We know, Lord, we will never suffer more than you suffer. Lord, we will never go through something that you yourself have not been through, that you can't somehow identify with our experiences, that we can't go to you and, and pray to you and think somehow that you won't understand. Because, Lord, you suffered, we can have life. And Lord, I pray today for anyone who is going through a particularly difficult time. Lord, you know every watcher today. You know every struggle that people are facing, some physical, some, some emotional. But Lord, even people here today who are struggling in their faith, who are spiritually struggling, Lord, just to, to keep their eyes on you and to keep the faith, we become perhaps distracted by things in this world or become discouraged by the sufferings that they are going through. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would restore to them the joy of the salvation that we have in Christ. That, Lord Jesus, you would give them faith and hope to believe that you will work all things out for your good, Lord. The sufferings that we have, Lord, is all good, Lord. The difficulties that we go through is all good, your purposes, Lord. Nothing will ever happen to us outside of your good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so, Lord, we commit our brothers and sisters here today who are going through such hardships, Lord, and such adversity. And Lord, we ask that you be very near to them, that you'd strengthen their faith and help them through their difficulties, Lord. We pray, Lord God, for each and every single one of us, Lord, as we go out into the world, Lord, with this great message of hope, that we go into a suffering world, Lord. We will interact with many people who are going through many difficulties, Lord, and struggles, Lord. Lord, we can say that all will be well through faith in Jesus Christ. We can give them a real message of hope through your resurrection of the dead. You who are not spared, you are not spared suffering and adversity, Lord, that we might have life. That, Lord Jesus, that we can give the world those we come into touch with, those we come into contact with, Lord, a real message of hope as we go from this place today. We thank you for the hope that is ours. We praise you. We exalt your name today. You, Lord God, glorify, worthy of all our praise for what you have done, not only in your death, but in your resurrection too. In Jesus' name, we give you the honor. Thank you. Let's stand as we close off our service this morning. One last song.